Welcome to Law Flips, an unfiltered conversation about law, life, life coaching, and everything in between. Today, we speak with Mike Baer, who is a two-time New York Times bestselling author. He's a TV personality. He's a personal development coach. He's also a TikTok star. You're great at promotion and marketing. Why should people listen to this episode of Law Flip? People should listen to this episode of Law Flip if they have any doubt that they need to change something within themselves, or if they're a little bit curious about asking for help or how do they improve their mental health because they're sick of seeing these ads on TV talking about mental health <laughs> and that hopefully they can get some words of wisdom and some tips to get well. Amazing. All right. Also calls for any legal questions. one 833 Flip. Let's get into the episode. Law Flip, Law Flip, objection, your honor. Turn, turn the game upside down. Law Flip, Law Flip, objection, your honor. Turn the, turn the game upside down. Mike Bayer, I am so excited to have you on today. Benji Smith. <laughs> okay, Mike, first of all, I want to give a shout out to my brother, Sammy Smith, for introducing me to Mike. Yep. And I think by way of Randy Spelling back, I think it was like 13 years ago. So I'm so excited to have you on. I'm actually really grateful because uh, I've been in this grateful place the past couple of days because one of the first times we met was right when I got out of, uh, I moved back to California from New York. I passed the bar, young lawyer. And crazy enough, I was uh, in this place where I was literally driving to pick up a law partner in Encino from Santa Monica and driving downtown to court, dropping him back off. And then on the way home, I would be eating to the point where I wanted to throw up mm. and I would throw up. And I was like in this crazy place in my life where I was completely unmanageable. And I found my way to you. And uh, I, you, you were on my couch in Santa Monica and you basically convinced me to take a leave of absence. And so like to, to see you go from, you know, you were already successful, but now you're on top of the world and I'm in a much different place and I'm just in a really place of gratitude. So it's oh. like really fun to have you here. I know I'm, I've, uh, as I've told your brothers, I love, you know, and your brother, Jeremy is an attorney that I yeah. utilize quite a bit. So it's, I've always loved you and your family. You know, you got two brothers, attorneys, your dad's an attorney. A bunch of sickos. Well, it's a family you don't want to <laughs> fuck with. I mean, I'll tell you that much. We try. You got a pretty, as long as everyone gets along. <laughs> but uh, it's really good to see that you've, uh, you know, a lot of people ask for help and they don't do the help. You yeah. know, it's help is kind of like a transaction where the yeah. other person that you're reaching out to offers something and then you make a decision whether or not to do it. Yeah. And throughout that process, there's a lot of decisions with people reaching out. And a lot of people will say they want help, but once you put your hand out, they kind of don't put their hand back out or they yeah. kind of say, well, I'll call you next week. You yeah. Know? So one of the things I've watched for you, I mean, you're like a regular on Dr. Phil, two best uh, selling books, New York Times, mm -hmm. and a very successful business person. I'm trying to figure out, do you sit back and ever actually experience gratitude or is it just like, let me get to the next thing? Oh yeah, like I can't believe, I'll sit in my house alone last week and I was like, I can't believe I have all this. I mean, it's just stuff, but I'm like, gosh, this stuff was pretty expensive. Like I have more than one house and I don't really have a name for what I do, but yet like <laughs> people know I help What do you people. do? What do you do? What the hell do you do? Yeah, it's a good question. I avoided, now I'm, they call, on Dr. Phil, they call me Coach Mike, which essentially I'm a, a life coach, but for 10 plus years, I avoided that at all costs. You know, I would call myself an advisor or consultant or if it was a drug addict, a recovery advisor, because I mm -hmm. always just thought life coach was one of those, like you're an attorney. Someone can't say they're an attorney unless they pass the bar. Right. But with some professions in mental health, especially a life coach, uh, it's really hard for people to be able to differentiate. And there's a lot of people who are jack of all trades and masters of none, and sure. they're just trying to get the next buck. And a lot of people see that on social media. That's actually a really big point. So you now no doubt have heard people say, oh, like this is a sham. This is just a money making scheme, yada, mm -hmm. yada, yada. Do you still experience that? How do you address those quote unquote haters? It's interesting since the last three years is the period of time I started doing television. It was never on my vision board to do TV. And I had lunch with Dr. Phil and another client of mine. And I was introducing the two of them because my client, part of what I would do as a coach, 
was set up amazing new relationships and dynamics. And I thought I was bringing the two of them together. And in that meeting, the meeting flipped on me where suddenly they were, he was saying, yeah, Mike would be great on television to Dr. <laughs> Phil. And then I went on an episode two or three days later and my, I've done 40 episodes, you know, Dr. Oz, Rachel Ray going on breakfast, Club, like a lot of, uh, media. And I found that it's kind of interesting because there's this whole like mental health is so important and you see celebrities talking about mental health, but it doesn't trans, it doesn't go through the plumbing system to the consumer. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone thinks they're doing something good, but no one has ever asked me for help because of what some celebrity has said on television right. or social media. And it's, if you look at anyone who works in mental health, it, it, you, they're kind of polarizing on television. People either love them or hate them. So on one hand, everyone's like, let's have more mental health, but there's not a lot of seats at the table because half the people don't want you to have a seat at the table. Yeah, and you said that somebody's polarizing, or a lot of these figures are polarizing. There's a kid that I grew up with in the recovery community, and he's very polarizing. And one of the things he does is he literally broadcasts um, the lives of the people who are recovering through the recovery process. And he has his whole justification for it. But what do you think about that? Like, like you are out there, you're on TikTok, mm -hmm. you're all over the place, but I haven't seen you put people on like from your recovery center, for instance, only when they've asked me mm -hmm. or their managers have asked me, mm -hmm. like I went on Kelly Osborne's podcast because I worked with that family, I don't know, 15 years ago. Sure and helped her on one of her journeys of getting sober. So if, if there's opportunities where the, the person asks me, I'm cool with it. But no, I mean, if anything, I don't, it's, 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 it's extremely difficult in a service prof profession because I've seen this with attorneys even at events. There's a, a line that you kind of have to walk where the client still knows that they're the most important thing to you. Right. And if you're trying to push your personal brand and you're also leveraging other people, it doesn't really work. It can look kind of off to a lot of people or uh, unethical. And which is a point that you and I both have to take seriously because we're both, I have a podcast and I put stuff out there. You are all over the place. How do you toe that line and how do you uh because i think a lot of people would say oh what he does it's it is unethical mm -hmm. because he's basically making it about himself why is it important to do that what i realized and why i made a decision to become i suppose more of a brand was i was going to iraq I was going to open up a mental health clinic for Yazidi women with the Kurdish government. And I started going alone. I mean, I know it's completely I mean, random. That's a whole other story. <laughs> okay. But I like thought, okay, I don't want to work with celebrities anymore. This is my new calling. I was with a client in Greece. And then Any I'd... dealings with like the Bin Laden family? <laughs> no, <laughs> but I, um, I love the middle East because it's just I a bizarre too. landscape. And, uh, I, when I came home, I thought that I was going to be able to sell like jewelry from the Yazidi women on music tours. And I could get all these people that love me and trust me. And none of their publicists would get on board because in the United States of America, it's not attractive to a lot of them. People's hearts don't go out for these tragic stories in Kurdistan. Mm. They, their hearts go out to, you know, kids and police or fire, whatever, right? Like, like, stories in the US. And so I had a moment where I realized I need to become my own brand. And what to bring I, credibility to whatever cause you want to Yeah, because no one cares. And that's the thing is like, if, if for me to go do something that I really want to do, if I've just helped a lot of people, it there's no cachet. Mm. And having, you know, a few New York Times bestselling books and having a bigger social media presence I find allows me to get in the room because no one sees how you're helping people. You, you know, and it, again, you don't want to be exploitive. So no one sees how you're helping people. You can't go out there bragging about it. So you could go do this for the next 30 years. And then if you want to go do something that requires people to know who you are, if you're in private practice for 30 years, 
you can't do that. You're right. kind of ball and chain to the business, right. you know, and I like new, you know, I, some people like to do the same thing for years. Speaking of new, yeah, uh, your TikTok presence. So <laughs> I do off the wall things. Yeah. Uh, you literally like will be in, you'll have a serious talk about, you know, sobriety, uh -huh. recovery, and then you'll be in a suit and somehow it'll cut to you being in like, I don't know if it's like a G strip, like what, I don't know where you describe anymore. it. Yeah. It's as ba you're basically like tooth floss is covering your penis. Yeah. How, <laughs> how did you make the decision to go, to be able to be comfortable, right? Like we're in these, I'm in a professional business lawyer, became, you're a. Yeah. I became comfortable when I realized people will hate you no matter what. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, if people are going to love or hate me for however I am. Uh huh then might as well do exactly what I want to do I mean, and let like, go of anybody's point of view, you know, and I had to be, it's been gradual, you know, I, I, at first, and I have moments where I'm like, why am I doing this? Right. You know, but then I'm I like, the why thing, not? Cause like my dad is like a traditional lawyer, Mark. you know, Mark, Mark Smith, the greatest. Um, he pretty much like if I talked about doing any of the stuff that I do currently back when I was working with him, it would be like no chance. Mm. Right. And we're just in those businesses where doing this stuff like makes very little sense to the traditional mind. Mm -hmm. Like, and you're talking about breaking through that. And then you also talked to me about how like you coach people to make a lot of money. And mm -hmm. I think part of that is like buying into this concept of like not doing the same thing as everybody else. Tell me about that. I mean, there's a few that one is like, how is someone defining success? Mm -hmm. So for some people, it's money. Some people, it's they want to get married. For some people, it's how their family life is. But in terms of making more money, it feels better to make money when it's authentic. And it comes from a place of who you really are. The challenge is it takes time because making money takes time. Mm -hmm. And everyone will go look at like, oh, Bitcoin or, you know, all these examples of making money overnight. But I've found that being a thinking partner for an executive or a CEO or a business owner, making introductions that, you know, ultimately could save them a lot of money, helping them have conversations that are uncomfortable where they can trim the fat. Because a lot of people we have in our lives, people or things that we kind of just let keep going and it, it can weigh us down. And then what are some decisions that we could make today that would really change things? You just have like ultimate confidence that you could pretty much go into any situation, recovery, business, sex life. Some I can't, like, yeah, like some I'm not. I, I, now I can- Is there any aspect of life that yeah, you don't feel confident I would you can help people with? The, well, the majority of people I help today are for free. So people will call me and I'll sit down with their friends. or family. Everyone will always be letting me pay you and I don't, I don't really want that transaction. I do the same stuff. Especially with people who I'm kind of knowing or close to. Because you could always then back away from it if right. you want to. Like there's there's a lot of people that I f that reach out for help and I, I recommend other people. Mm -hmm. Part of it is how excited and driven and passionate we are because you can either take the paycheck, attorneys do this. And attorneys I think are even more challenged than someone like me. When I'm helping someone, I can get really outside the box. Someone who's an attorney, depending on the type of law, there's only so much you could go outside the box because there's laws that govern. Right. Life coaching, there's no laws that govern. <laughs> right? Because there's, there's no like universal there, license type of correct. thing. Correct. So I have a lot of flexibility and I can be a little more eccentric yeah. and extravagant with what yeah. I'm doing. But there's definitely aspects of life. Like I do not do well um, with people who are in a chronic state of being a victim. Mm, I don't either. Yeah, that is that is a tough one for me to deal with. Yeah, and I and I you don't have to. Well, you maybe don't. you do. I don't know. <laughs> what? Why is it so tough to deal with people that are in a constant? That, that is because like, they're that's so un, interesting. they're unwilling to gain insight into themselves. Yeah, and they want to point the blame instead of looking within to see how they created this situation. Okay, you don't like to deal with it, but you have. To, let's say right now somebody says, Mike, you have to deal with it. This person, to change the entire world trajectory, we need to get this person out of a state of victimhood. What do you have to do? Dep it depends. Some people, they're constitutionally incapable. Mm. There are some people that no matter what, and all of a sudden they'll become a victim of you. Oh. All of a sudden you've done something wrong and you could have dedicated a several years. Yeah. 
And all of a sudden it flips on you because they're incapable of being honest with themselves. Yeah. There, there's some people like this and that's definitely not a fit. That's the toughest person or sort of a identity type that I have a hard time with. Yeah. Um, okay, recently mm -hmm. uh, Rudy Giuliani, I think mm -hmm. he's still licensed to practice, I'm not sure. Yeah. It depends if he's had it taken away from him or not. He seems to have a problem with alcohol but he will not acknowledge it. So he, he, he keeps getting asked about it and he won't acknowledge that he is an addict. Mm -hmm. How much of a struggle are you still seeing the lack of the ability to acknowledge a problem? Well, if someone like him, who's powerful and in the media has an alcohol problem, there's no consequences to their behavior today mm. because they're already getting kind of destroyed and they don't wanna give any power away. So it becomes harder for people sometimes who are like a CEO or an executive or someone in a powerful position to ask for help. They also don't trust people typically yeah. around them. They feel like everyone around them, they pay or there's a business relationship. So, you know, there's two things that motivate people to get well, quick well, right, is consequences by them choosing not to. So a guy like that, what consequence is really gonna bring <laughs> up his bottom, right. right? And then pain that's related to not changing. And he could be just medicating, let's say if he is drinking, because, and that's helping him show up, he believes. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've had it where, you know, I've had someone's kids and wives and the law firm and everyone show up and the per that's still not enough. Yeah. So. You know, uh, it's uh, everyone's uh, bottom looks different. Absolutely. Okay. I read this quote from the actor Michael Williams from The Wire, who tragically recently passed away, that, and he struggled with addiction, and he was quoted as saying, being sober doesn't stop the craziness. And it made me think of, you know, if you're a professional and you don't have like an obvious drug or addiction like drugs, alcohol, food, or mm. whatever, you're just kind of like fucking crazy. Just You, you just can't figure out you know, what to do with yourself. Um, you're working like crazy. You're not happy. Like, are there any treatment centers like for just general trauma and like being miserable? I've owned a treatment center for over 15 years called CAST centers. So there's clinical, which is depression, anxiety, drugs, alcohol, diagnoses. And then we have coaching division, which is for people who need to take action that are stuck. I think it's figuring out for someone, what is it that they actually need? Like, what is the problem? Mm. Our brains have a hard time without a thinking partner to identify the problem because it sucks to feel like we're not grateful enough or we had have no purpose or what's the point of any of this. But having a thinking part, I don't know how people get through you see, life. You keep saying thinking partner and people, people, you know, they're listening probably have no idea what you're talking that about. That could mean a therapist, a coach, um, someone in your field, uh, a teacher, a wise counsel, someone that is unbiased, someone that has no gain and is going to help you navigate this problem. You know, just because a therapist, that's like people will say, well, I went to therapy or, you know, therapy is more common than someone going to, let's say, a life coach. Mm -hmm. uh, someone will say, oh, I've been to therapy. And I'll be like, yeah, and I've been to hairdressers. And some <laughs> suck and some are good. Right. And I've been to attorneys. Right. And, you know, I probably had 30 attorneys in different ton of, capacities. Ton like, of shitty attorneys. But for whatever reason, people are like, oh, no, therapy's not for me. There's infinite types of therapy. I've been to, I, I would say, 15, 20 therapists in my lifetime. And I didn't really love any of them, but my current therapist. And, like, thank God I kept looking. Yeah, and you a know? lot of people don't. No. Yeah. Um, okay, so what is the biggest challenge that you've ever come? Is it, is it, is it, is it getting clean and sober? What's the, I mean, coming off crystal meth was pretty hard. Was that tough? It seems like an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was in rehab like for like chill. nine months. <laughs> it seems like a chill one to get off her. I think um, the greatest battle that I've gone through is the critic towards myself. Yeah. And how I talk to myself and treat myself. How? What's like the worst like when, when you treat yourself the worst, what does it sound like? The voice I sometimes will get is, uh, 
what's the point? Um, you're not, you know, you're not loved, you know, um, you're not good enough. Uh, you're fraud, you know, like that, that would be the voice. I know how to quiet it very quickly now. Like I can, can do some Kung Fu with it, <laughs> but for a long time, I didn't know how to shift the narrative. Yeah. And so, um, and knowing what events bring out that voice. You know, we're not Gandhi. We're not going to be able to go into every setting and not think that we're going to treat ourselves like shit. But is that the con is like the feeling like insecure and not good enough and feeling a like fraud? Is that the common theme that we all sort of struggle with and 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 that sometimes manifests in drug use and alcoholism? Is that generally what you see? Generally, I see people that just don't want to feel feelings mm -hmm. or have really low self-esteem or their self-worth is defined let's say like i know a lot of attorneys that for whatever reason it's just <laughs> interesting they a lot that done that do coke right or that love a little cocaine do you I, I told you when you came in here today for some reason seeing you i got a very cocaine feeling like a, a like i was high on cocaine i don't do cocaine yeah but I felt like I was on cocaine seeing you, but no. But I, I definitely know a lot of attorneys that have, have played with the nose candy. A lot. Not to make light of it, but. Yeah, it's interesting. But that's because a lot of attorneys will work so much. It's a high pressure, high stress profession. I mean, it's very difficult. You're essentially going to battle <laughs> with another guy who's passed his bar exam and is ready to go to battle. Yeah. And you have both clients wanting the best possible outcome. Yeah. So as a and who don't want to spend that much money and some attorneys are gross with their billing. So people have had bad experiences. Oh my God. It's you're, you're encapsulating a lot of the struggle. I just had an attorney send me a bill. I let her know that we weren't moving forward with her <laughs> because I just, I didn't have confidence right. in it. Right. Because where I, I've worked with attorneys enough to know that research can mean a thousand different things to attorneys. And she sent me an email. I said, I need to break down your billing because my retainer, of course, you know, it goes away right away. Right, right, as right, soon right. as you say you're not working with someone anymore. <laughs> and on the bill was an email to send me the bill. She billed me for it. <laughs> Good for her. She's really and I responded. <laughs> I responded and it said, you know, I'm not you because she's part of a very reputable law firm. And I said, look, I, I'm new to this type of billing practice <laughs> if you would like me to speak to someone else in your company i'd be happy to do so and she removed it but you know attorneys have a very stressful prof i think attorneys profession is way more stressful than mine because attorneys have to know the details mm. you have to be so good at details you cannot miss one thing on a piece of paper what's it been like to work with attorneys because i know you've dealt with a bunch i've dealt with a bunch i swear to god your brother's my favorite that i've worked with jeremy yeah. He's handled situations and I felt like, oh my gosh, there was actually justice. This guy's rock solid. In my family, Jeremy's yeah. like the low key, like gangster for lack of better right. words. He's like this guy that everybody looks at and they think, you know, he's the chill brother. No, no, he will come for you. <laughs> but he's, he's super relaxed, but I've had all sorts, you know, I've had these big firms before and you, the retainer, $10,000 retainer gets eaten up in a day. Yeah. And you're like, Nothing got done. We haven't even sent an email. Yeah, I mean, that's why I switched to being a plaintiff's only attorney where I basically represent employees and people that were injured and I take a percentage and I'm on their team and it's like we win together or we lose together. And what percent of the cases do you take that are brought to you? Very small. Because it's contingency? Just because there's so many people that come to you that think they have a case and it's not. It's not. You know? Um, anyway, I could do this for a long time, but we have to move to the legal tip of the month. This is the legal tip of the month sponsored by the power hitters at Benowitz Law Corporation. If you've recently lost your job and you're struggling with depression, anxiety, or other mental health concerns and you have the means to do it, please find a therapist for help. In addition to helping with any legal case you may or may not have, it'll help you feel better. And the most important thing after job loss is finding a way to feel better and take care of yourself so you could move on to the next endeavor and hopefully bigger and better things. This is sponsored by Smith Law. It's a employment, personal injury, and class action law firm. So 
Alcohol and drug rehab leave is guaranteed by California law. It grants the right to take time off work in order to voluntarily seek treatment. Every private employer who regularly employs more than 25 or more employees is subject to the law. If your job doesn't have 25 or more employees, you may still be allowed reasonable accommodations. Contact us to discuss your options. 1-833-LAWFLIFT. Mike, yes. it was so fun to have you on. Yeah, it's good to be here. Really good time. Um, okay, so for everyone, make sure you hit subscribe if you haven't already on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Mike, please leave the people with some parting words and where people can find you. Where the easy part will be where you can find me is Coach Mike Bear on all social media platforms or coachmikebear.com. I've written a few books. One's called Best Self and another's One Decision. And then I have a podcast called Always Evolving and because uh, it is always evolving. Mm -hmm. And um, your, your parting words. My parting words would be that we all need help yeah in some way or another and our mental health we're not taught to ask for help with it we're not taught about it in school growing up so it's really normal to get a trainer when we want to improve our body but we typically don't reach out for mental health help until it's a crisis and my words of wisdom would be that you know we can raise our quote bottom today or bad spot by seeking out some help and picking up a book or going to a therapist. And that's my words of wisdom. I love it. Thank you so much, Mike. It was a pleasure having you on and we'll see you next month. Law flip. Law flip, law flip, objection, your honor. Turn, turn the game upside down. Law flip, law flip, objection, your honor. Turn the, turn the game upside down. Connect with us on Instagram. We're at law flip. Law flip is produced by Blue Crescent Media. You can learn more about BCM at bluecrescentmedia.com. Our intro music is provided by Pen Practice, and our law flip identity was created by Garrett Whiston and Travis Nagel. And lastly, this podcast is made available by Smith & Benowitz for educational and entertainment purposes only. By listening to this podcast, you understand that no attorney-client relationship is being formed between you and Smith & Benowitz or any of its attorneys. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice from a licensed professional attorney in your state. To the extent this podcast may be considered an advertisement, Benjamin Smith is the attorney responsible for this advertisement. Thank you.